Hello, today I'm going to take you through the various models that um, help to underpin what we do in facilitation. Um, but the, there are no actual facilitation skills models, so if you typed in facilitation models into a Google search, you're not going to find anything. But um, what we are going to look at is a range of different models. Um, as you can see here, there are a few we're going to look at, um, but they come from philosophy, psychology, how we learn. So it's looking at theories of learning. Um, and as a facilitator, we need to understand how learning takes place, um, how the experiences shape our behaviour and um, as a facilitator we need to understand people, we need to understand what makes them tick and we need to be able to understand their reactions and we actually need to understand our own as well so that we can understand the judgments we're making when we're making assumptions, when we're facilitating as well. So we need to understand all of this as a con as a concept to understand what's going on so that we can be better facilitators <clears throat> so as i said foundation of the theories for facilitation um relate to learning um so even with psychology we're looking at the psychology of how people learn and there's a lot of philosoph philosophical theories around um learning why people learn, how we learn, but um, these can all be applied to facilitation sessions and although most of the underpinning theory is looking at learning, understanding how we learn, what shapes our learning, what shapes our experiences, um, as a facilitator, even if you're in a business environment, you need to understand that because the key thing about facilitation is that you are working with people, you're trying to get the best out of people, so you have to understand them, you have to understand their motivators, why they're behaving in a particular way, um, so that we can then, as facilitators, decide what's the best way to move forward. So hopefully that's a little bit of context, um, which will help you understand why we're looking at the different theories. The theories I'm looking at are all the ones which are um, listed in CIPD's guidance for this unit. Um, there are obviously other models that you can look at, but the key thing is to always think about when you take the theories that you're looking at, think about how does this shape what a facilitator does and how is it going to help me as a facilitator to understand what I'm doing better and perhaps also understand the why we make the decisions that we make. Okay, so we're going to look on move on to working our way through the various theories. So the first theory um, or first group of theories is the humanistic theories, um, which looks at people and it's it's a very subjective view of people, so it's based on our own experiences um, and we have our own perceptions of people um, and humanistic supporters believe that um, people will always be focused on growth, development, as it says here, the fulfilment of potential. So if you think about um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that philosophy or sorry, psychological theory of um, you work through the pyramid and you start off with your basic needs and once those have been met you move on to your next level of needs. So humanistic theories believe that kind of idea of progression and always looking to improve things, always aiming for the next thing. So if you think about the pinnacle of um, Maslow's hierarchy, you've got self-actualization, which is the fulfillment of potential that we're always striving to achieve something. We're always striving to be better, whether it's um, better company car or corner office or status and recognition but we're always striving towards achieving something so for humanists or humanistics the idea is that 
as a facilitator, you're there to help people realise their potential. You're there to help them to work through whatever barriers they have, whatever obstacles they're facing. You're always going to work towards helping them achieve their goals. So generally, you will be a positive influence. You will see people positively. And you will always have this idea that people are always striving for improvement. They're, that you're always looking for the potential and you're looking for to, to draw that out. The real self versus the ideal self is this idea that um, people have an image of what they think they are and perhaps what they should be. So if, if someone has an idea that, you know, I should be a, an A grade student and they should be passing something first time every time and they don't achieve it, it's not a case of thinking, okay, it's a, an opportunity for learning, it's an opportunity for development, I can improve things. They beat themselves up because they've not achieved what they think they should be achieving. So if there's an imbalance between what you perceive to be yourself and what the reality is, that can lead to incongruity where there's a problem between your perception of yourself and the facilitator's role is then to help that person overcome this, to help them identify sometimes that the real, the ideal is not realistic. I mean, perhaps, yes, it is something that could be achievable. Um, there are some dreams that we know are nice dreams. We're never going to achieve, never going to, it's never going to be possible. Yes, you could work really hard. and um, But there are only so many top class footballers for example it's not something that everybody's going to achieve so someone thinks that that's what they should be doing as a facilitator you're also trying to get that person to realize that that's not realistic so there's a lot of work with humanistic theory about trying to get people to think about the realities and how do you actually achieve that how do you get there That obviously leads on to quite a key thought that um, to be able to facilitate that kind of discussion, the facilitator has to have a high level of trust. The person that you're working with or the group that you're working with, being able to trust a facilitator is going to be really, really important because if they don't trust a the facilitator, they're not going to open up. They're not going to talk. They're not going to talk to them. They're not going to share what's going on, share their feelings. So, as it says, that leads to three core conditions that um, the facilitator has to be real. If, if you like, these conditions are the key characteristics of the facilitator, what they have to be like. Um, so they have to be authentic and genuine. They have to be accepting so they have to have a, a level of acceptance so they've got to show that they value and appreciate the other person so it's not just about um what the facilitator is but how they behave are they showing that they respect the other person are they showing that they consider them to be equal that they are a valuable individual and they they are worthy of support, of helping them to achieve their potential? And do they show empathy? Do they empathise with the learner, the person that they're facilitating? Do they show support? Do they encourage? Are they non-judgmental? All of these things are really key to the facilitator. It comes back to what we discussed before in the last class about the facilitator being impartial, being neutral. Um, they have to be able to take a step back and not judge what someone else is going through, not judge the treatment perhaps or the way someone's been brought up. 
you just have to accept that that's the way they are and then from it's it's from that point that you're looking at how do we work forward how do we help this person to achieve their potential to do what it is that um, they're trying to do or they're striving to achieve so how do we get the most out of people and that starts with have, being able to accept them for who they are not judging them okay so that is the humanistic model obviously there is literature on middle that you can read the next one is probably possibly the most straightforward oops sorry the easiest to understand experiential learning is the idea that adults learn differently than children okay so um, where children can learn by rote, repeating something over and over again. Um, they just keep repeating something and they will learn it. With adults, they have to have experiences. Um, typically, an adult wants to understand why they're learning what they're learning, what the relevance is, how it relates to what they're doing back in the workplace, particularly if it's... Um, being sent on a training course for work, for example, they want to know how does this work back in the workplace? What am I going to do with this? So COBE is the first person that really came up with the expression experiential learning. And one of the key premises of experiential learning is that we have an experience, we learn something, we then have to take time to reflect on it, to think about why something worked or why it didn't. So for example, you would have the experience, you're listening to this lecture. I may then give you some questions to go away and think about it. Or you may just go and think about what you've been hearing yourself. You'll also be thinking about it in terms of doing your assessment. Um, you may think about your own facilitation skills. You may think about a facilitation session that you've handled and to some extent that's what you'll be doing with the um, skills part of the assessment so you reflect on you write a reflective statement about a facilitation session that you've been involved in what went well what didn't go so well you'll then think about okay how can i do things better how can i improve things so the abstract conceptualization this lecture fits into that a little bit as well because abstract conceptualization is about looking at theories, understanding theories, understanding why things happen in the way they do. But you can also use that stage to think about, okay, if my performance as a facilitator didn't go so well, what could I do differently next time? How can I adapt and change what I do? So you come up with a little theory of what you're going to do next time. Active experimentation is taking that idea, taking your thoughts and putting them into practice to see how it works out. So you're actually going to try it out and see what happens. So that's experiential learning. Cobb's idea is we have to go, that this model that we have in front of us is from Cobb. Cobb's idea is that we have to go through all four stages to get the most out of learning, that if we don't go through all the four stages, we're not getting the most out of our learning. So the facilitator's role would obviously be to help the learners through all these four stages. Um, and when you're designing training, it's, it's quite an important concept to bear in mind to make sure that you're creating opportunities for learning at each of these different stages as well. Honey and Mumford, who is who I've also got listed here, um, took this model and applied the idea that people have a preferred learning style and they created learning styles based on this. So possibly you've heard of Honey and Mumford's learning styles, looking at activist, which is your concrete experience, reflector, reflective observation, abstract conceptualization is your theorist, and active experimentation would be the pragmatists. So what they're saying is Honey and Mumford suggest that we all have our own preferences. 
And when we get to that stage in the cycle, we tend to stop there because that's our safety, our safety zone, our comfort zone. We don't want to go beyond that. So for Honey and Mumford, recognising that we have a preferred style, but we need to try and push through that. And again, the facilitator's role would be to encourage the learners to go beyond their comfort zone to try out different learning experiences, learning in different ways. Philip Bernard has wrote masses and masses of stuff about experiential learning and he's taken it and applied it. He's applied it directly to the development and the teaching of nurses. So he's put it into a very particular um, professional context, but his idea is reflective learning that we go through experiences and we have to reflect on it. So a lot of reflective practice. And just recently in terms of um, academics, lecturers within the college sector, um, we've had new professional standards created and a, a strong part of that is reflective practice. So Philip Barnard is the, is the protagonist behind this idea of reflective practice so if you're looking at something like that if that's something that is being encouraged within your own workplace then perhaps that's something else that you want to look at but the concept of experiential learning um, as a facilitation tool as a facilitation model can be quite important as well and again I've put um, some additional reading up on Moodle for you covering this as well So moving on from there, we look at Heron's six category intervention model. Um, hopefully the humanistic one was the heaviest theory. Um, hopefully I've made it not too complex and not too difficult for you to get your head around. I'm hoping that the next two that we're going to look at will be more straightforward for you. But um, I think from memory in your assignment, you have to write about three models. The guidelines from CAPD experiential learning is not actually listed in itself. It's the other the other three of the four that I'm covering in this presentation. But I am more than happy for you to cover experiential learning as one of your models um, as well. Okay, so moving back to Heron. Basically, he is building this model on the concept of experiential learning. Um, but also saying that the responsibility for learning lies with the learner. They have to take responsibility, they have to take control of their own learning. Think about a facilitator. Facilitator's role is to get the group to take ownership. So this sort of ties in with that idea as well, doesn't it? So if we want the learner to take responsibility for their learning, then yes, the facilitator, the, the, the teacher or the trainer can take on the same role because they're trying to get the learner to take responsibility for their own learner. As a model, the six category intervention has two different approaches. So there are six categories, but they're divided down into two different categories. So you've got authoritative categories and we have facilitative categories. And the next couple of slides detail those in a little bit more detail. So nice little diagram. That shows us the authoritative approaches or interventions, confronting, prescriptive, and formative. So we can see how they're more driven and led by the, the teacher, really not something that you'd want to be doing as a facilitator. Okay, sometimes you might have to confront behaviour. Um, informative. It's unlikely the facilitator should be imparting information, but obviously there are situations, as I say, these are learning theories principally. So you can see why as a teacher, lecturer, instructor, trainer, you would be informative. You're, you're sharing your information, exactly what I'm doing here. You're prescriptive. You're telling them what to do. It may be that laying out the process, setting the ground rules, at that point, perhaps you are being prescriptive. But typically, the facilitator should not be really using any of these three um, interventions. They should be using the bottom three, the ones that are client-centred. So they should be cathartic, 
catalytic and supportive. So really, as a facilitator, you want to be focusing on those three um, categories. Next, we have a nice little slide, which I'm sure you can print off. Um, the article this has come from is also, um, there is also a link to this up on Moodle for you. So you can see, I'm not going to read through the slide, but you can see that there are three different styles on the facilitative side. Um, in your assessment, I would be looking for you to talk about the fact that there are six, that you do have the split between authoritative and facilitative. You may want to put in a copy of this diagram, make sure you reference it. Um, but if you're using this model, focus on the three that the facilitator would be using and explain why you would focus on those three and not the other three. Last one. Um, so this one's a little bit longer to take you through, but because there are three steps and it's important that we work through all three steps so that you clearly understand the, the process that Casey Roberts and Salomon are setting out. Um, so what they do, rather than looking at how people learn, how people are reacting, this does look at that a little bit as well. This is more looking at the process which again is perhaps quite good because facilitators should be looking at the process rather than what's going on. They actually should just be looking at the process of how the group works through whatever it is that they're trying to work through. Where this one's a little bit different is it draws on all the other theories. So as a facilitator, you need to have a good underpinning knowledge of all the different theories that are out there, not just the ones that I've covered in this presentation. There is masses and masses of literature out there. So a th someone working with this model would have a knowledge of all the other theories and they will be adaptive. They will deal with each facilitation session based on what, from their experience and from their knowledge, what they believe is the right approach. So they won't take one model and apply that every single time across the board. No variation, no deviation. They're going to look at a particular situation and decide what's appropriate for that situation. Okay, so they're going to look at, as it says, the people being facilitated. It looks at the dynamics. It will look at perhaps also the content, what it is I've actually got to achieve. Are they facilitating learning? Are they facilitating a board meeting where there's perhaps more tension because everybody's vying for their own interests? Um, but it also looks at the facilitator. It doesn't just look at the group, it looks at the facilitator themselves as well. So there are three steps to this. Taking in making sense and intervening. And I'm now going to go through each of those individually. We have a nice little diagram if you want to. Um, just make sure you reference everything properly if you're going to put diagrams into your um, assessment. So step one <clears throat> is taking in. So taking in what's happening in the group, what the behaviours are, how they're interacting with each other. So awareness of what's going on around about you is really important so you've got to be aware of the group but as I said in the introduction to this one you've also got to be fully aware of yourself you've got to be aware of how you feel maybe what your prejudices are what your thinking is what your opinions and attitudes are how you react to other people you have to be really aware of what's going on with you as well how you're feeling how you're reacting to particular situations Observation skills are going to be really, really important with this because you've got to be picking up on the non-verbal cues in the room as well. You've got to be aware of what everybody's doing, where people are sitting, how they're interacting with each other or not interacting, how they're behaving. So you're looking at all those sorts of things. And the reflection, I've already talked about how you need to be aware of what's going on within yourself as well. So there's a lot to be aware of before you've even started facilitating. You've got to be 
intuitive as well, I think, to some extent, but you've, that observation is really, really important. And again, the more that you facilitate, the more experience you have of doing this, you'll pick up more, more cues. Right, okay, so as I said already, you're going to be using the theories that you know, the knowledge that you have of the group, the knowledge that you're bringing with you, and your past experiences. Um, all of those things will help shape what you do, how you react. And it helps you to understand the behaviours that you're observing in other people. Um, as I said, what model or models you use. I mean, it's not a case of, right, okay, today I'm going to use experiential learning. You may take elements of different models to make it personal for that particular group. <clears throat> the self-awareness is really, really important because you have to understand how you're reacting, why you're reacting the way you do, but also you have to be aware of how you're interpreting things. You have to be aware of the assumptions that you're making based on the group's behaviour. Um, they could seem disengaged and you could assume that, oh, they don't like me and you then get defensive and your behaviour changes because of this. But it could be that they're just being forced to come or they're not sure why they're there. They don't know each other. Um, there's lots of things going on in the group um, that could be shaping their behaviours. But we, a lot of the time, individuals, whether it's us or whether it's a group, so you, know, you also have to be aware of these thought processes could be going on within the group as well as within yourself. But you have to think about a lot of our judgments, a lot of our behaviour stem from our interpretation. And that interpretation is our own personal experience. And we put ourselves at the centre of our little universe. So we think things are going to be more focused on us. Um, but every other person in the room is making exactly the same thought processes, making, making the same judgments. So... You have to be careful that you're interpreting the information that you're observing correctly. I hope that makes sense. So here's some examples that might um, give you think, help you think about things. So look at that first one. Group, group becomes quiet, dilatory speech, sort of dilatory speech, repetition, no new ideas. Round in circles, no spark. If we were in a classroom, I'd be asking you what kind of reasons could, could cause this. Um, just think of some for yourself. So it could be they don't like each other, they're falling out, there's, they just don't want to participate. It could be they're tired and they need a break. It could just be that it's time to move on to something new. You know, they've exhausted whatever it is they're talking about and they're ready to move on to the next topic. So you have to be aware of this happening, but sometimes you have to, rather than making judgments and, and making assumptions about why they're behaving this way, you need to ask them, okay, so this is what I'm observing. You are quiet. We're going around in circles. There's no new ideas. Why do you think that's happening? And get them to give you the feedback so you can find out, is it a problem? Or is it just that you're actually ready to move on or that they need a coffee break? Butterfly, excuse me, butterflies in my tummy. Nervous because it's a new group. It's a group I haven't met before. I get this every time I um, start a new course. I get butterflies in my tummy. It's, it's normal, it's natural. Um, but it could be that you've got something big happening afterwards. It could be nothing to do with the group at all. It could be that you've been challenged by somebody in the group and it's a nervous reaction, sort of panic almost. Lots and lots of different reasons that that could be happening. Oops. 
So Tony has spoken six times and for five of those he was looking at Bill. Why would he do that? Could it be he's looking at Bill, expecting him to challenge him? Is he challenging Bill? Is he looking to Bill for reassurance? We don't know. It could be Bill his best friend or Bill his enemy. We just don't know. So again, you need to try and stop making your own assumptions because the last time you did facilitation, this happened and that was the situation then. Doesn't mean it's going to be the same situation this time. There's lots of different interpretations to what, what happens and why people are behaving the way they do. Our judgment, our interpretation of these are going to be based on our previous experiences and not perhaps the reason that's in the room itself. As I say, you need to observe, but with that observation, you also have to take a step back and think, is that a realistic interpretation? But it's important to put it back to the group and say to them, Tony, every time you speak, I notice that you're looking at Bill. Or you ask Bill what he thinks, or, you know, you need to, you need to find out why that's happening. And is Tony hogging the conversation? Is Bill making noises because Tony's not letting anybody else speak? From the information here, it's difficult to judge. So step two, taking in. I think some of this I've already kind of discussed through it, haven't I? So the facilitator needs to be comfortable with a range of theories and models. So that comes back to what I said before at the beginning of this theory that um, the, the facilitator needs to be a bit more experienced because they have to be comfortable working with all the different theories and deciding what's appropriate at any given situation. Um, I know from my own experience as well that you have to be flexible. Sometimes you can arrive to do a facilitation session expecting to be handling it in a particular way, using particular tools or techniques and that's not working and you have to change, you have to be adaptable. Um, as I said before, looking at step one, you have to be impartial and open to consider different interpretations of what you've observed. So step one would be your observation. Step two is really about reflecting on what's happening. Step three, and this is where you actually start facilitating. So step one and step two are before you actually even do anything. So you're looking at the group, you're observing what they're doing, you're observing the behaviours, you're thinking about how you're feeling, you're trying to understand why you're reacting the way you are. Step two is really thinking about all of that. So if you think about experiential learning, that's your reflection. Okay, so you're, you're thinking through. So step three is deciding, right, the group's working away. When do I intervene? When do I actually step in? Um, ideally, facilitators there to help set things up. The group are working well together. There's no need to intervene. So if you're intervening, you need to ask yourself why you're doing that. Is it because the group aren't taking control? aren't taking responsibility and they're looking to you. So how do you get them to stop looking to you to intervene? Are you intervening because you don't have the confidence to let things run? Or are you intervening because it's necessary? So you have to keep in mind always, what is the role of the facilitator? What are you there for? Okay, so that you're not intervening unnecessarily. Um, Sometimes that can be hard, so taking a step back and allowing the group to work through things and only jumping in or only intervening when it's absolutely necessary. So think about why do I want to intervene? What am I, what am I going to be trying to do? Why am I doing it? Um, and then think about the role of the facilitator. Does that match up? Am I intervening on, under one of those circumstances? 
So as it says here, the first objective of facilitator is group awareness, getting the group members to be self-aware. So you're facilitating to help their self-awareness, to help them to take control. Questioning skills, so intervening when the group perhaps needs encouraged to reflect more, to think more, to come up with better ideas, to dig a little bit deeper. So if someone says something and it's not challenged um, and you want the group to, you want to try and help facilitate the discussion, to get the discussion going, you might intervene with questions to get them to think a little bit more, get them to elaborate on why they've said what they've said, what the thinking is behind that. And again, the facilitator insight comes with experience. You know, when do you want to share? Again, that will vary depending on whether you're in, inside the company or an external facilitator, whether you have knowledge on the topic they're facilitating. But again, if you're going to intervene you have to be sure that you're intervening for the right reasons and not because you have the answer to that question. You need to facilitate, you need to be getting them to come up with the answers, not providing the answers, you're not there to instruct. You're not there to share information, you're there to facilitate sessions. But if that insight, if that sharing helps to develop trust, helps to build the relationship so that they will work better together and they will trust you. That may be a justified reason for intervening, but you only intervene when it's absolutely necessary and it fits in with the rules of the role of the facilitator. At the very beginning, um, at the very beginning of your facilitation session, you may, as part of the ground rules, you may want to establish what is the role of the facilitator. Why am I here? Some people may think that you're there as a trainer. You're there to give them the answers. You're there to tell them what to do. So you have to be really clear at the outset what is the role of the facilitator. And if need be, you come back to that. You say, this is what I'm here for. This is my role. This is what I'm doing that's not my role that's put it back to the group and sometimes you have to be assertive you have to have the confidence to stand up to challenge and respond to that so I think that is the end of my presentation I hope it has helped you understand the different theories that underpin facilitation and can help you see how they may relate to facilitation itself